the beautiful and welcome to makeup. I I'm gonna get so bogan during this video, aren't I? Well, cute. Love that for me. <laughs> Hello, beautiful, and welcome back to Water Cooler Convo Makeup, where I talk about the things that you want me to talk about, where I talk about the things that I want me to talk about, and sometimes we meet in the middle and I talk about the things that we want me to talk about. And I have gotten quite a few requests asking for my take on RuPaul's Drag Race Down Under. <laughs> Oh. Also for context, I am a fan of RuPaul's Drag Race. I've been watching since season five, being Jinx's season. And then when it wasn't airing, I went back and watched one, two, three, four, and All Stars one. And I am also an Aussie. I am also Australian. So I got a lot of opinions. Um, aggressively mediocre is probably the biggest. <laughs> But when I originally wrote these notes, I wrote them after watching episode five and I, I had a lot of opinions about that episode in particular, but I thought that I would give the season one last chance with episode six to see if somehow by some sort of miracle, it changed my mind. Ish? Like, like ish? Not really. The kind of. <laughs> Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't caught up to episode six of Drag Race Down Under, I will be discussing one through to six in this video, in my analysis. So uh, maybe go watch that first if you don't want me to spoil something. You've been warned. Disclaimer and content warning, in this video, as I've specified, I will be discussing Drag Race Down Under. So in this video, I will have topics of racism specifically towards Australia's First Nations, as well as the death of Azaria Chamberlain and the wrongful imprisonment of Lindy Chamberlain. If you find any of these topics possibly triggering, please proceed with caution or consider clicking off of the video altogether, because at the end of the day, I don't want any of my content to jeopardize your well-being and your happiness. Also, I say this every Every video but I need to make sure that even though I trust you guys I do not promote encourage or endorse any kind of negative malicious or harassing behavior to anyone that I discuss in this video this video is strictly for entertainment and analytical purposes so I don't want any kind of hatred to go out there into the world because of something I've said or on my behalf we're allowed to keep it cheeky we're allowed to keep it messy we're allowed to keep it fun but keep it to this channel and this channel only and this video only okay so I'm attempting to do some drag makeups I've done this once before um she was she was a good first attempt <laughs> now in this video if you haven't gathered yet you are going to get quite a lot of spicy negative opinions from me when it comes to drag race down under so i do want to say that going into it when it was announced when everything came out all the marketing all the promotion i was so excited i genuinely wanted to love this season i wanted it to be in one of my top threes i wanted it to be in my top threes of drag race seasons but unfortunately what i've seen apart from episode six has been so aggressively disappointing so aggressively mediocre but what i am hoping is that even though yes i'm not super pleased with how the season is coming together at the moment i am hoping that when it all is said and done when the winners announced when the final episode drops i can sit here i can film another video and come to you guys and be like hey i was wrong like i, I eat my hat rupaul's drag race you proved me wrong I'm so sorry that I ever doubted you. It's not very often that I hope that I'm wrong, but this is definitely one of those times where I, I'm almost begging that I'm wrong. <laughs> like begging. But at the same time, I unfortunately just don't see that happening unless something substantially changes or the winner that I think should be announced is announced. I'll make my points as I go through the video, I promise. I definitely don't think it's the worst season of Drag Race, but at this point in time, I definitely think it is one of the worst, which is definitely not what I or anyone wants for Drag Race Down Under because we want we want the world to see how like just top tier Australasian drag is. We want everyone to see what Australasian drag has to offer to the world. We want a second season, but with just audience response at this point in time and also the possible winner at this point in time 
I'm really nervous that we're not going to get a second season. Because genuinely, I think it's an injustice to Australasian drag if all that the world knows about Australasian drag and Australasia in general is Vegemite Crocs, a dingo ate my baby, and weird sayings. Like, that's... Bullshit. <laughs> I literally have no idea what I'm doing. Okay, this is fine. <laughs> I've got this. Um, I've I've bust out some I've bust out some really intense trust the process looks before. I can do this. One of the biggest flaws, if not the biggest flaw, that I have found in my analysis in my watching of the RuPaul's Drag Race Down Under series in comparison to the other RuPaul's Drag Race series is just as simple as character and story development in this season. It it just. It's almost non-existent. And yes, I do understand that it is a reality show and with reality shows, you kind of just have to let things run their course because we're viewing people's lives. But at the same time, even with reality shows, there is still some sort of sense of character and story development. That way, when we get to the end, we get to the finale, we get to the winner announcement, we have this overall satisfaction where majority of the audience is sitting there like, hell fucking yeah. There is just an overall satisfying outcome for the entire audience. Because watching a winner's journey from who they started as at the beginning of the season to who they are at the end of the season is part of the overall satisfaction that we get. So for example, Bianca Del Rio, when she started her season in season six, she was this harsh, abrasive insult comic. I don't know about you, but I think it's pretty safe to say that when it comes to a reality show, if you go into the audition saying that you're a harsh insult comic, Majority of the time, they're going to look at you and be like, oh, we have our villain for the season because you are going to say the things that are most abrasive, the most insulty, because you're a freaking insult comic. So how do you make someone like Bianca Del Rio, who starts her season off as an insult comic, as likable and as lovable as someone like Adore, who was her other top three person along with Courtney Act? You show off her motherly moments. You show off her kind heart as well as her insult comic shady cheeky moments. With Bianca, we were able to see her help out a door with another cincher so that she could help her with her hog body. Even with Trinity K. Bonet, Bianca was, yes, quite harsh with some of her critiques throughout the season, but at the same time, when it came to their group challenge, Bianca was incredibly supportive and hyping her up from the background. It did benefit Bianca to do it, but at the same time, we got to see her put aside her differences with Trinity and also get some sort of a friendship with her because of this challenge. This is gonna look awful. It's fine. <laughs> Bianca was consistently shown to know her shit through and through. She knew her worth, she knew her craft, she was insanely talented, and she was never afraid to deliver to the judges and the audiences 100% every single week. And when the other queens needed a helping hand, Bianca was more than happy to lend that helping hand because she was a true winner at the end of the day and she wasn't threatened by the other queens because she knew her shit. Which is why when it came to the season finale, even though yes, you may have wanted someone else to win over Bianca, like Adore, like Courtney, at the same time when she was announced the winner, no one was sitting there saying that she wasn't deserving because everyone knew she knew her shit. Another example, Sasha Velour of season nine. Throughout her season, it looked as if either Trinity or Shay were going to take home the crown for that season. But as soon as those petals fell, there was no possible way for Shay to be in that final lip sync after that. That was, that, if you weren't sitting on the edge of your seat, like, ah, like, what were you doing? Let me know down in the comments if you were someone who watched that like rose petal lip sync and didn't lose your absolute mind because I wanna know if people out there exist. Then with Peppermint's wig reveal and dress reveal in her lip sync with Trinity, unfortunately, the same thing kind of happened because the audience once again lost their absolute freaking minds. So there was gonna be no possibility to have Trinity in the final either. So throughout Sasha's season, you needed to edit her so that she had some sort of a winner's edit, but somehow make that outshine the edit for Shay and the edit for Trinity. So Sasha throughout her season was edited to be her own little slice of fun, this honest intellectual kind of fun. She was always authentically her and people just loved the kooky weirdo-ness to her. And I think one of the ways that they were able to do this was throughout season nine, there was a lot of heavy, tough, intense conversations that was happening in the workroom when the Queens were putting on their 
makeup. And quite a few times it was Sasha's commentary in the one-on-one -on -one that was highlighted as a voice of reason, as a voice of equality. I'm not saying that she's the only one that got this kind of edit, but I'm just saying that she did get quite a lot of one-on-one -on -one honest equality kind of confessionals. So because of this, she became a primary face of equality within the show. With equality being a huge motif throughout all of the RuPaul's Drag Race seasons. Evie Oddly of season 11, she probably had one of the most complex winners edits that I've ever seen because how do you make someone who's had one win throughout the whole entire show, one iconic bottom two lip sync win in comparison to some queens who have either not had to lip sync or have won two to three challenges? That's a hard edit. From what I could see, her winner's edit was just from pure resilience throughout the season. Evie was incredibly open on the show about her condition and fighting through all of the pain that she was having to fight through day by day being on the show and also outside of the show. She had injuries on the show, still pushed through, and she just showed every single episode how hard she was fighting for that crown. With a lot of the other queens consistently undermining her for every single challenge just because she was odd. While still airing her less than favorable honest critiques of the other queens, which would have been far too easy to edit her like a villain for doing that. But instead, if anything, they edited the other queens like the villains for underestimating Evie the whole entire time. So with a lot, if not all of the queens continuously underestimating Evie throughout her whole entire season and her fighting every single episode throughout the whole entire season, when she won, Evie got this huge eat it bitch kind of moment. And guess what? We ate it with her. So what we can see from this is that each winner's edit is different, which makes sense because each queen is different off camera camera and on camera. Each queen's aesthetic is different. Each queen's talents is different. Each queen is different when they start the season to when they finish the season. Just each queen is unique. Each queen is individual. Each queen is different. So each winner's edit has to be different according to the journey of the specific queen and according to who the specific queen is. Because for each season, no matter what the reality show is, essentially, whoever is the cast, they are the ingredients and the crew and the producers and the editors bake the cake. So knowing how some of the past queens have been edited for their winner's edit, let's have a look at the queens that we have left on Drag Race Down Under. We have Kidamine, Electra Shock, Scarlett Adams, Karen from Finance, and Art Simone. So essentially we have two queens that have been called out heavily for racism, one queen who was brought back unfairly into the competition, an underdog, and Kidamine. Please tell me, except for Kidamine, how do we give any of the other queens any kind of satisfying winner's edit? I I am begging someone to explain it to me because it is so hard to find it personally. And I'm singling out Ketamine because from what I can see, she's doing fairly well in the competition, especially after episode six. So like good on her because her performance was beautiful, but she's also enjoying herself. She's still joining in on the cheeky shade without being malicious in it. She's had a few like, oh, kind of comments to Anita Wiglet, but at the same time, you can see that there is a really strong basis of friendship and love and compassion and respect there. So all of the shade seems to land with Anita and she doesn't seem to be insulted. So therefore like, why would we be insulted in a way? Once again, it makes sense in my head, but it doesn't mean that I'm communicating it. Either way, I digress. Kida is joining in on the shade, but isn't being malicious about it. And a lot of the other queens seem to have a really good positive view of Kita as well. And in all honesty, some of the moments that Kita has shared with Anita or Electra has actually restored my faith a little bit in the series. So that's nice. I'm not saying that I think she's going to win because I have a sneaking suspicion that she's not going to. But what I'm saying is I hope that she does because she is the only queen that I can see in this competition at this point in time that could have any kind of satisfying conclusion being crowned the queen. Because legitimately, how do you edit the other queens? How do you do it? Because next in line for a satisfying winner's edit, surprisingly is Electra Shock in my opinion, because Give an Australian a good underdog story. We eat it up. We eat up a good underdog story. There is a reason why one of Australia's favorite, like nationally favorite. <laughs> there is a reason why nationally one of Australia's favorite Olympic wins is Stephen Bradbury. <laughs> that man won by default. 
No one's but twice. <laughs> From what I saw of episode five, I thought an underdog edit could have been genuinely on the cards for Electra. But watching episode six, there was quite a few comments from Rue, Michelle, and Reese saying that she keeps following this I'm still learning storyline and eventually that's going to run out. And that she hasn't had her I'm this queen kind of moment yet. But she literally won the challenge from the episode before. Like she can't go from winning one week and them saying that she hasn't had a queen moment yet. Unless they're saying that she's not going to win, right? So I thought it was a possibility after episode five, but after seeing episode six, I don't think it's a possibility anymore. Which is kind of sad because for me at least, there was quite a few moments of like, yeah! that I felt as though outweighed the oh kind of moments with Electra. Next we have Art Simone. Art Simone in my mind is kind of a sad one in all honesty. I'll make my point because in my mind she does deserve to be on the show but also she did deserve to go home episode two. But unfortunately, the way that she was brought back into the competition was seemingly unfair. I think that if she was brought back into the competition because she had a competition with the other eliminated queens to be able to get back in, the audience would have accepted her. We would have accepted her back into the competition and been like, yeah, she deserves to be here. But the way that it's been presented and edited to us, it feels like they just let her back in. The way that Rue phrased it on the show was after Art was announced and brought back into the competition, Rue and her had a heart to heart in the workroom when they were all working on their trash to treasure outfits. Rue specified that her Bindi Irwin was just not it, which it was not, but that Art's Bindi was not an accurate representation of how funny, fast on her feet, quick witted Art is. So because of that, Rue decided to bring her back into the competition because it wasn't an accurate representation and she felt as though Art deserved more. But the issue with this is, is that we literally got one episode of Jojo Zaho. I don't really think that that's an accurate representation. Like, one episode. Someone make that make sense for me. <laughs> but also, yes, and I'm probably being, I am being very biased here. I've seen Coco Jumbo live. I've seen a few of her drag shows. And you know what? I don't think what I've seen in Drag Race is an accurate representation of Coco either. So essentially what we have here and what has been voiced by the audience and voiced by Coco on Twitter as well, is that we had three queens that weren't given an accurate representation of who they are and what they have to offer Drag Race down under. And yet one was just kind of thrown a bone. Come on, it's just not fair. So I'm not saying that this is what happened, but what I am saying is that I theorize that this is what happened. This is just my hypothetical theory. This is alleged. But what I theorize is that the crew of Drag Race Down Under, so the editors, producers, directors, all kind of banked on art making it far in the competition so that they could write a lot of storyline around her. So they probably had a lot of storyline mapped out specifically for her to carry through for them to make good TV. So when she was eliminated, they were kind of sitting there being like, oh crap, what do we do now? They probably panicked because they had no idea what to do now because the queen that they were banking on for most of their storyline was now no longer in the competition. So to fix this for themselves, they just simply brought her back, no questions asked. And I don't see anything wrong specifically with bringing a queen back into the competition that's been eliminated, as long as it's done fairly. As I said before, a lot of the eliminated queens have been brought back before through a competition between eliminated queens. So then they get the best of the eliminated to be brought back. It's a fair competition to be brought back into the competition. That's fine. The other way that queens are brought back into the competition fairly is by coming in for the next season and starting from scratch and starting with a clean slate and being judged alongside with the other girls from the get-go. This happened with Cynthia Lee Fontaine. This happened with Eureka. This happened with Vanjie. Hello, future JJ here, editing JJ here. Sorry that I look like trash, but I don't know how this has happened. So I'm gonna keep an eye on myself whilst I'm filming once again, because it's in my notes, but whilst I was delivering it, I completely misspoke and just like cut out a huge chunk of my notes. So in the video, I say that Nacia Lopez was the only other queen to be brought back this way. Not the case because we had in season three, Carmen Carrera and in season four, we had Kenya Michaels. So 
that exists, JJ, what you doing? But I don't remember seeing that much backlash, if any backlash, when the two queens were brought back. And I think that's one, because social media just wasn't as big back then. So it just meant that the audience voice wasn't able to be heard as easily. But two, these were the baby seasons. This was the third and fourth season of the series. And they're still trying to develop the formula, the blueprint, just come up with twists, try and make entertaining TV while showing off all this just extravagance. So because of that, when they bring a queen back in, one, they picked a decent queen, which is dope. Uh, but two, when they bring a queen back in, it's more of a twist. Oh my gosh, the twist. Give it to me. Give me that good TV. Not so much the unjustified comeback that was given to Art Simone. You get a bit of leniency for three and four because he's still figuring stuff out, but you're up to like the 20th season of all of them together now. You know what you're doing. You know how to make good TV, but make it fair. The only other time that a queen has been brought back into the competition with something like this was Naysha Lopez. And I don't remember specifically, so I could be wrong, but I don't remember anyone having an issue with Naysha coming back into the competition the way that she did, simply because Layla and Dax screwed up the I Will Survive lip sync so badly. I was not living. I was looking for the exit with that one. I was so excited for that episode to be over. I was like, please make it fast make it hurry up. So because they screwed up a lip sync to such an iconic song, both of them got sent home so there was a space to be filled. So yeah, fill it with Naysha because she did try really, really hard with her lip sync and she did try really, really hard with the first episode. She just, like a lot of RuPaul's Drag Race queens, didn't take sewing lessons. RuPaul's Drag Race, I don't know if they do sewing challenges. So I don't know if I should over prepare by taking lessons. <laughs> Stupid. So really, this is the first time in Drag Race history where a queen has been brought back into the competition unfairly and it's it's left a sour taste in the audience's mouths and also some of the eliminated queen's mouths. And I do not blame Art Simone for this whatsoever because if we were in her shoes and the producers or RuPaul came up to us and they said, hey, we want to let you back into the competition, no questions asked, clean slate, go for gold, baby cakes. Like, we'd all be taking it. If if winning RuPaul's Drag Race is your dream and you have the opportunity to come back into the competition, no questions asked, you're taking it, right? So in my opinion, yes, it was unfair for Art to be brought back the way that she was brought back, but at the same time, she did what anyone else would do in accepting that offer. So if you're gonna blame anyone, blame Ru, blame the producers. After all of the backlash that Art Simone is receiving and RuPaul's Drag Race received for bringing her back so unfairly, does anyone really think it's possible to give her a satisfying winner's edit? But from my research, the one thing that all three of these queens that I've mentioned so far have in common is that none of them seem to have an issue with racism in their past. It's a very low standard. But apparently it's a standard that we need for RuPaul's Drag Race. Insert Karen and Scarlet. Both Karen and Scarlet have received a lot of criticism over the years throughout their career and then more so when they were announced that they were going to be on RuPaul's Drag Race for their racist past. Karen in her youth got a racist tattoo that she has since covered up, but this tattoo specifically was a picture of a racist doll that is unfortunately still available in parts of Australia. But I won't be showing any images in this video of Karen's tattoo and I won't be showing any images of Scarlett's racism either because I do not feel comfortable having that imagery in my videos. I just don't think it's necessary. But if you do wanna see these images and see what I am talking about, if you type into Google images, Karen from Finance, Racist Tattoo, it will pop up. And if you type in for Scarlett, Scarlett Adams, Blackface, you will also find it. So do with that information what you want. Karen is incredibly lucky that she hasn't been called out on the show publicly like Scarlett has been called out on the show, but it doesn't matter because the internet knows. The internet knows that Karen got this tattoo. The internet knows that Karen had this doll collection. The internet knows that Karen covered it up. The internet knows that Karen made a choice to get this tattoo. The fact is, is that Karen chose to have a racist doll tattooed to her skin permanently. As I said before, Karen has had the tattoo covered up and Karen has made a public apology online, but at the end of all of this, it isn't my apology to accept. But from what I've seen online, the apology hasn't been widely accepted and Karen has caused a lot of pain from getting this tattoo. So then the question is, how do you give a winner's edit to a queen who the internet knows got a racist doll tattooed to them in their youth? I don't think you can. 
Then we have Scarlet. Between 2012 and 2016, Scarlet performed in blackface, one of the performances being on Australia Day and stood to make a profit from these performances. I cannot do this conversation justice, so I will be leaving links in my description discussing Invasion Day and also the discrimination that Australia's First Nations have suffered since the 1700s. And I encourage anyone who has no context to this situation to read these articles on Invasion Day because there is a great importance in changing the date. But Scarlet was recently called out publicly in episode 5 of Drag Race Down Under for the performances in blackface and making a profit off of it. As I said before, I won't be putting these images in my video, but if you do want to go see the images for yourself, just Google Scarlet Adams blackface into Google Images and the images will pop up. But not only was she called out in the workroom by other queens, but she was also called out on stage by Rue by Michelle. But Rue said on the main stage whilst calling out Scarlett that instead of cancelling her like so many people would want her to, she was going to use this as a teaching moment instead. And the audiences were not buying it. You can see the outrage everywhere. It's all over Instagram. It's all over Twitter. It's all over the internet. Scarlett even made an apology outside of the show as well and put it on their Instagram and the comments on it are not well received. And with this situation and Rue calling it a learning moment, a teaching moment, I've seen two different kinds of perspectives as to why people aren't really buying it. The first being that a lot of RuPaul's Drag Race fans were calling for the disqualification of Scarlett Adams in this situation because it would not be the first time that a queen was disqualified from the competition. The first one being Willem back in season four. The original story that we were told, but Willem has since dropped a teeny bit of tea on Twitter explaining it further. But what we were told originally was that Drag Race contestants are supposed to be in isolation in their hotel room for the duration of filming. But Willem was receiving a few conjugal visits from their partner at the time. They were having some fun adult times and this broke the rules and Willem was disqualified. But as I said before, Willem has since dropped a teeny bit of tea on Twitter explaining the situation further. And by the looks of it, Willem was probably seen as a nuisance by cast, crew and producers on Drag Race for knowing her worth and not taking any bullshit from them. So when the opportunity presented itself, they just cut her so that it would make their jobs easier. Then in season 12, we had Sherry Pie who was disqualified at top four and then edited out of the season as much as possible before it aired or as it was airing. As the show was airing, Sherry was accused of using a false identity to coerce five men into sending them sexually suggestive fetish videos in the promises of getting them acting jobs. Promises of acting opportunities that of course Sherry was never going to follow through on because the acting opportunities didn't exist and they were scamming these five men. Yet Scarlet is allowed to remain in the competition. The only reason I can see for keeping Scarlet in is similar to Art Simone. She's doing seemingly well in the competition. She's making good commentary, making good storylines. She's just making for good TV. So to take her out, ruin some of the entertainment value of Drag Race Down Under. Once again, neither that for Art or Scarlet is proven. It is just my theory. There's no evidence to support it. It is alleged. The other perspective and point that I've seen is just to do with what was happening in the episode in general. In episode five, the queens were asked to name, market, brand, and film an advertisement for their own yeast spread, very similar to Vegemite. An Australian delicacy. And of course, a lot of the queens went for the vulgar kind of jokes, just a lot of piss, poop, discharge, vagina, penis, butthole kind of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> very, very in character for Drag Race. <laughs> but in a lot of the critiques that the queens got on the main stage, they were told that their jokes were too vulgar. They crossed the line and there is a line between funny vulgarity and just straight up vulgarity for the sake of being vulgar. I hope that sentence made sense. So with this revelation in the workroom that Scarlett had performed and profited off of blackface, as well as her apology on the main stage and the acceptance of this apology, it seems to the audience, to the masses, especially looking at social media that Rue and Drag Race Down Under were kind of saying poop, piss and discharge are too vulgar but blackface is okay. This seems to be the vibe that the audience is getting from this specific episode if you look at comments on Instagram and on Twitter. Is that really what you want your show known for? Once again, this isn't my apology to accept, but with all the context that I now know and all of you now know from watching this video, I just don't think it's good enough because if Willem can be disqualified for having conjugal visits, 
I don't see why Scarlet can't for profiting off of blackface. So once again, I ask you, how do you edit this specific queen with this specific history, this backstory, this storyline to be the winner of RuPaul's Drag Race Down Under, to be this, to be the winner of RuPaul's Drag Race in general? There is no possible way that they could edit Scarlet now for her to be a satisfying winner. There is no possible way. So with all of that said, Keita, Electra, Art, Karen, Scarlet, which one of them can have any kind of hero edit for them to be a satisfying winner of RuPaul's Drag Race. The only option we have is Keita, which for me personally, I don't know if this is the same for anyone else, but I think that's kind of sad because when I see a top three, a top four, whatever, when I see the top queens, I wanna be sitting there thinking that it's anyone's game or at least it's between two people. I want there to be an almost equal fight. I will of course have my favorites, but I wanna be able to sit there and be like, who's gonna win? But in this situation, it's kind of like, well, I think I know because there's no other option. <laughs> Is that not sad? But unfortunately, not only do I think that we are just absolutely screwed for a winner's edit at this point, I think that the overall editing of the season has just been because for me personally, when it comes to the editing, there has to be some sort of level of contrast. There has to be a good amount of light and shade. So we are kind of spoilt for choice when it comes to villains in this season by the looks of it. Because don't get me wrong, I love a good bit of shade. I love a good bit of reading. I love a good bit of cheekiness. But there's a difference between having some cheeky, messy fun and just being malicious, just being mean for the sake of being mean. We've had et cetera, et cetera, being mean for the sake of being mean towards Electroshock. We've had Scarlet Adams being mean for the sake of being mean to Electroshock. We've had Art Simone be mean for the sake of being mean to everyone. We've had Karen from Finance being mean for the sake of being mean to a lot of people as well. So there just seems to be a lot of people who are being mean for the sake of being mean because it's fun, it's cheeky, it's shady, oh my gosh. But I've left a few episodes being like, wow, everyone's just kind of an asshole, aren't they? <laughs> the only exceptions to this are Anita because it's Anita. Keita seems to be having a good amount of respectful, loving shade, which is great. It doesn't, none of it seems malicious. Maxie had a few early on, but she seemed to get less shady and more just happy to be there by the end of her run. There's been some good moments, don't get me wrong. Like one of my favorite lines throughout the season has just been Art Simone saying, condolences on your shitty outfit, that. <laughs> There's some cheeky, messy fun. But then there's just a lot of tearing each other down and it's like, yeah, for plot purposes, it makes sense. For storyline purposes, it makes sense. But after a while, it just becomes like an absolute strain to watch. If something's too negative, then you just get to the end of it being like, ugh, I feel so emotionally drained. If something's too positive, it feels a bit too bland. So you need a healthy amount of both so that you've got enough momentum to get you through each episode, to get you through each season, but enough light that you're sitting there not feeling emotionally drained at the end of every episode. So as I said before, we're spoiled for choice with villains, which lucky us, but really, is a villain going to be the winner? I know that there's been some shady queens who have won in the past and that's fine, but is a villain villain going to be the winner? No! They're edited to not be the winner. They're edited to be the antagonist to the winner. The winner being our protagonist. An example of two sides of the coin, one season that I think definitely lacked a lot of light and shade was season seven, which is hard for me to say because I love Trixie. I love Katya. I love all of those queens individually, but the season itself was an absolute strain to watch free watching it. I, maybe it's just a me thing. Once again, I'm very much a sucker for a good amount of contrast, but... From season seven, re-watching it, I did find it quite a struggle to watch. I did find it quite a strain to watch because there wasn't enough light and shade. There wasn't a distinct protagonist, a distinct antagonist. And when Karcher went home, my opinion was kind of like, well, who do we have left? Season seven to me overall felt very filler. Which is really sad to say, because I don't want any season to ever feel like filler. I want it to feel like its own moment in history. But compare season seven to season two All Stars, which, oh, that is in my top like three seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race. There is a great selection of queens. There is a great contrast of light and shade. There was great challenges. There was great high highs, great low lows, great lip syncs. There was just so much goodness 
all round in season two and it's definitely one that I can keep going back and back and back and back and back to and just watching over and over and over and over. There was some great fantastic moments in that season. So Stan, if you want a blueprint, All Stars 2, there it is. If you need help, call me. I might be able to help you out. <laughs> But further from this, unfortunately, not only do I think that there has been a massive screw up in the hero edit and just the overall editing, but also some of the staple RuPaul's Drag Race episodes were just so bleh. Snatch Game was like pulling teeth. If Anita Wiglet wasn't in Snatch Game, what did we have? Because with Snatch Game, what you aim for is, of course, 100%, but what is a good Snatch Game is 70% of the impersonations are just good stuff or even mediocre stuff, and then the other 30% are the ones that are going to be in the bottom. So you want to have at least two queens that you're sitting there being like, I don't know which one's going to win. The ones in the middle that you're like, they did say some funny stuff, and then the bottom ones where you're like, oh gosh, please, please make them stop. But unfortunately, we had Anita, who was definitely the top and was always going to be the top because all of the other queens were either so, so bad or they were just on the lower side of mediocre, which is... And that's not what I want. Sorry, this video has gone from analytical to just me ranting. So um, usually I'm a lot more together about it, but apparently my brain decided, woo! Um, so that's cute. Love that for me. But one of the performances that was deemed as safe by RuPaul actually created quite a lot of controversy in Australia, for those who don't know. And personally, I I thought it was incredibly distasteful. <laughs> of course, talking about etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, impersonation of Lindy Chamberlain. I'll be honest, when she was in the workroom and she said that she was doing Lindy, my my face dropped. Um I I was really glad to see that Karen and Art had a moment to voice their opinion of how do you make that funny uh, because for those who don't know I'm gonna give you the context. August 17th 1980 Azaria Chamberlain was snatched whilst her family was camping at Uluru by dingoes and was eaten. Lindy Chamberlain her mother was charged with her murder and was sentenced to life in prison. Five and a half years later Lindy was released from prison and given 1.3 million dollars in compensation for false imprisonment. From the day Azaria died for about 32 years until 2012 until a coroner supported Lindy's recount of events of that night Lindy was destroyed by the media. Lindy was ripped apart, she was demonized, she was villainized for decades by Australia, by the press, by society, by everyone, because they believe that she murdered her child and profited off of it. And people still believe it to this day, even with all of this evidence behind her, that suggests that she did it, that suggests that she's innocent. So regardless of how appropriate it is for a mother to take her nine week old baby camping at Uluru, the fact of the matter is, is that Lindy's daughter was torn away from her and eaten by dingoes. And the media never gave her a chance to grieve this death. So of course, the woman who was terrorized for decades for the death of her daughter would be the most hilarious Snatch Game character, wouldn't it? Like that is just, doesn't that just tickle your funny bone? So the level of distaste in doing Lindy Chamberlain as a Snatch Game character is one that has left quite a sour taste in a lot of Australians mouths, including this Australian's mouth. Because I personally, I don't see how that's funny. I don't see how you can even make it funny. And I get it, vulgar humor can be absolutely hilarious. As I said before, Anita's performance as Queen Elizabeth II, perfection. And she had quite a lot of vulgar jokes. But with vulgar humor, there's a lot that goes into it to make sure that that vulgar joke lands. One, it has to be funny. Two, it has to be intelligent and witty. Three, there has to be some good comedic timing to it. And four, it depends what or who is at the expense of the joke. So if we compare it to Anita's performance as Queen Elizabeth II, funny, intelligent, comedic timing, all great. The expense of the jokes was Prince Andrew, Queen Elizabeth's relationship with the Corgis, the Queen's awful treatment towards Meghan Markle, the Princess Diana part of it was... Like, I'll give it to you, that one was possibly too far. But the expense of all of Etc's jokes was a mother who lost her child, who was jailed for it, who was then terrorized by the media, and was never allowed to properly grieve the death of her child. But also there are so many other Australian icons that you can do for Snatch Game. There are so, they didn't even have to be Australian. There are just so many other people that you could do for Snatch Game. Personally, I wanna see Dr. Frankenfurter. I wanna see someone do Dr. Frankenfurter. I think there is just so much material with it. I think that it could be so funny if it's 
it's done correctly. Also, the commentary that you could do with how it hasn't aged well. You're welcome! So the staple video for RuPaul's Drag Race, the video that all of us are waiting for and get excited for. Everyone, I'm pretty sure everyone gets excited for Snatch Game. Everyone is waiting for Snatch Game. That, that episode was just... Just so mediocre and... Also just heartbreaking to watch with the Lindy impersonation. And if Anita wasn't there, what did we have? And it's even more insulting watching it as an Australian because I know that we're better than that. We have so much more to offer than just that Snatch game. But also as an Australian watching Drag Race Down Under, I don't know, and maybe other Australians in my comment section can help me out with this one, but is anyone else finding it a bit gimmicky? Maybe it's just a me thing. And I don't mean the queens themselves because some of the queens are from New Zealand, but with the Australian queens, like they, of course they're gonna sound Australian and do Australian things and say Australian things. Like that makes sense. But the show itself just feels so oversaturated with just Australia. And not even New Zealand. And they're filming in New Zealand. And I'm saying this because of some of the things that the judges have said. Some of the things that have happened in the mini challenges. Some of the things that have happened in the maxi challenges. Being the Vegemite spread thing. Even some of the runways. Like Bogan Prom and Sheila of the Bush. And it's like, okay, we get it. A lot of the queens are Australian. Haha. <laughs> like even some of the lip sync songs. I, I'm not sure if anyone outside of Australia and New Zealand have even heard of Vanessa Amorossi. Like, don't get me wrong. The song slaps. The song is a good old bop, but I'm not sure if anyone <laughs> outside of Australasia has even heard of it before. But also just because a song's a good song, that doesn't mean that it's a good song for a lip sync. And I feel as though that we've gotten so many songs that are good songs, but they just, they make for mediocre lip syncs. And that's really, really sad to see because I, I want myself a Valentina, Monet exchange into you kind of moment. I want myself an Evie Oddly Brooklyn Heights sorry not sorry kind of moment, but I just, I don't think we've gotten that moment and I fear that we're not gonna get that moment. I think the first challenge being the hometown challenge was perfect because it got to show off bits and pieces of everyone's story, bits and pieces of where everyone grew up, bits and pieces of Australia and New Zealand in a way where it felt natural, it felt authentic, it didn't feel oversaturated. It made sense. But as time went on, it became really, it became really gimmicky. And as an Australian, I can sit there and kind of watch and see how we may be interpreted and that's a really weird feeling. I'm enjoying so much more watching the New Zealand queens and learning about New Zealand in the show because that feels natural, wildly. That one feels so much more genuine, authentic and natural. And that's really, really fun to watch. But also we're not educating anyone on Australia or New Zealand's contribution to the LGBTQAI plus community. Because for what it's worth, one of Australia's biggest tourist attractions is Sydney's Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras. It is such a good event. There is so much history behind it and it is just so widely celebrated. So why, instead of doing the Vegemite challenge, didn't they do a challenge where they branded, marketed, designed a float and did an ad for Sydney's Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras? Not only do I think it just would have been a great episode in general and I would love to see what the Queens would do with something like that, but also it gives a broader scope of what the LGBTQAI plus community looks like in Australasia and just it just shows that we're more than Vegemite and freaking crocodiles and bogans. One of the reasons I feel so strongly about this and why I think I'm getting so worked up about this is because when I watch the original American version of Drag Race I just I don't get that same vibe of we're in America so it's like why, why are we doing that for Australia? Of course there'd be some of it in Drag UK and I'm not saying that there isn't I'm just saying that it doesn't feel as oversaturated as Drag Down Under does but also maybe that's because I'm too close to it living in Australia but also maybe the editing is just better because in saying that I found the editing of the UK seasons far better than Drag Down Under but unfortunately it just seems to be how the cookie is crumbled for Drag Down Under. I'm glad that they seemingly 
haven't done it for New Zealand, but once again, as I said, it could just be that I live in Australia, so it's hitting like really weird for me, but I'm just not seeing it with New Zealand. I'm gonna put a sugarcane kind of nose. But with all this negativity does come some positivity because episode six was literally everything I had been hoping for. Episode six was an amazing episode to me. It was a great episode. It was a solid episode. I was just, it, was, it was such a good episode. There was the right amount of contrast. There was some amazing moments. There was some shady moments. Kita got a win. Kita got a hero edit, which I love. Love. And just the footy club in general looks like they were having so much fun and that is what I've been wanting to see. I want to see people there enjoying themselves. And even though the footy club was a New Zealand footy club, I didn't feel this weird little oversaturation that I've been feeling the whole entire time either, which was also fabulous. Literally, these footy players have made the season for me. These footy players are going to be the highlight of my season because they they were enjoying themselves so much. They were into it so much. Carl with the breastplate and the hairdryer and the corset just jiggling around. It just... That is something that I could watch over and over and over and still be smiling and giggling to myself the whole entire time. Electra shocks moment with Farah as well because Electra was trying to make sure that she spent as much of this challenge nurturing this drag transformation with Farah, which was so nice to see. Because isn't that what the show's all about? Nurturing these queens, their skills, their talents, their confidence to make them the best queens that they could be. Isn't that what the whole entire show is about? So seeing a queen try and do that for their drag daughter was so much fun. It was so good. I love the whole entire episode. So throughout this video, when I am saying that I am thoroughly disappointed in this season and thoroughly disappointed in Drag Race Down Under, I do not include episode six with this. I do not include the makeover challenge in this because I, I could not fault except for some of the makeovers themselves, I could not fault the episode. Ultimately, I do hope that when the season wraps up, I can come back here and I can film another video and I can spend the whole entire video apologizing for me being wrong and me being wrong in my opinion. I hope that I can come back here and be like, hey, we had a rough start to the season, but it really started to pick up and I'm so happy and I'm so glad. But for the moment, unless Keita wins, I, I just, I don't see it happening and that's, that's just so disappointing. Because as I said before, how do you edit any of the other queens to be a satisfying winner? But also, I'm sorry if either of the two queens that have a racist history are crowned as the winner of RuPaul's Drag Race Down Under, what's that getting across to the rest of the world? In all honesty, what's that getting across to everyone else? Episode six was a great episode. And if they keep going with the structure of that episode, the contrast, the light and shade, the not as oversaturated kind of stuff, I understand the mini challenge kind of was but if we keep going with the structure and just the fun of episode six for the rest of the season we could possibly have an absolutely redeemable season we could possibly have an actual decent season one for drag race down under but if drag race down under keeps going down this really weird path that it was going down from episode one to five then I fear that we're gonna have a similar season to season seven, which is filler. But I will say Rue's outfits in this season, whoa, they were, they are all kinds of lush. That like Ugg boot inspired outfit in the last episode, that was so different for Rue and that was, I thought it was fantastic. But before I fix my lips and I go off and fix my wig and give you a true reveal of the look that I have created today, uh, how about I leave you with some positive things. If I can't find links, I'm so sorry, but definitely go watch them however you freaking can because I can watch them over and over and over and never get bored and just be happy with the world for the first time in years. One of them is definitely the Evie Oddly versus Brooklyn Heights Sorry Not Sorry lip sync because that was, it was stunning, it was, it was so good, I could uh, and then the head flip, I just, so many parts of that lip sync, I was just sitting there just in absolute amazement. When it was a double Shantae you stay, like, yeah, of course. Like, if you sent either of those girls home, you are absolutely insane. Another great one is the Monet Exchange versus Valentina lip sync fit into you. I know I specified both of these before, but oh my gosh, one amazing lip sync. I, it, both girls absolutely destroyed it. But if you listen really, really closely, you can hear Monique Hart losing her absolute mind. You can, you can hear her in the background. Ah! 
I want a hype person like Minicart. I need a Minicart in, in, in the background of all my videos all the time. I would never get any work done, but you know what? It would be so much fun to have Monique. I just, I love Monique. And the last little nugget is courtesy of season 13. Oh my gosh, there are compilations on YouTube. This one will be linked in the description of Rosé dancing like a toddler in the background of all of the lip syncs. It just brings me such pure joy. It just brings me such pure joy. I now find myself dancing like Rosé because I just, I, I love it. It's so much fun. Just... <laughs> Ooh. For a second attempt, because I've done like a drag kind of look before, but for a second attempt, I'm not too mad. You can tell that the wig isn't on properly, but that's because I just, one, couldn't be bothered because it's midnight at the moment, but two, I'm still not quite sure how to do wigs. And the little harshness going on here was me trying to cover up some face paint that got stained to it ages ago. So if you have any advice on how to, how to do wigs properly, I would really appreciate it. <laughs> But also here's my predictions for the rest of the season because I don't know if you all want to hear it, but I may as well give it to you because let's see if I'm correct. What I think is going to happen is I think the top is going to be Kita, Art and Scarlet. I think Kita is going to win strictly based off of how else do you edit any of the other queens to be a satisfying winner? Also, I'm pretty biased. I want her to win at this point, but also I can see them try to swing art as a winner. I just don't think it's going to be well received no matter how they edit it. So winner wise, I'm thinking 70% Kita. 30% art. Scarlet is gonna be top three, but she's not gonna win. Which means that the next two queens to go home will be Karen and Electra in no particular order. I actually think that the next lip sync may be between the two as well, because even though both queens are really, really talented, I think that Electra is probably gonna get red just because she hasn't elevated her taste, her style, her look, her aesthetic or anything like that. And she's gonna get red for still learning on the show when they're getting up to the top four, but also she's probably gonna get critiqued for showing nothing new to the judges that they haven't previously already seen in lip syncs or in the Queens Down Under challenge that they had. With Karen, I'm not sure what her talent's gonna be, but I think she's probably gonna get red for not showing enough Karen in the performance, like she's been read the whole entire season. Karen keeps getting critiqued that she isn't showing enough of herself and she keeps holding back within the season. So I feel as though this is probably gonna land her in the bottom four next week when the whole entire challenge is to show off your best talent. If I'm right, I'm right. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Whatever, it's just my predictions from my analysis. Oh. But please let me know down in the comments what you think of this video, what you think of Drag Down Under, because maybe you've seen something that I just haven't seen. Maybe you have a different perspective than me, and I really, really, really want to know it, because maybe you can show me something that is positive that I just haven't seen in this season yet, because I am literally craving it right now. I am, I am starving for some really good television from Drag Down Under. Oh, the lips is starting to come off. Oh, that's disappointing. I tried to put on eyeliner. Oh, let me fix that. But also please let me know down in the comments what you want me to talk about because I know what I want me to talk about, but I don't know what you want me to talk about unless you tell me. And I've said this in so many videos before, but I like learning. Your girl loves to learn. Your girl loves to research. And maybe you have a golden little nugget that I don't know about yet that I would find absolutely fascinating. I would find absolutely so satisfying to research and learn about. So I need you to let me know. I need you to comment it. And while you're commenting about this, whilst you're commenting about Drag Race Down Under, while you're commenting what you think about this video, also comment about what you think of my face because Oh my gosh, a wig could definitely do better, but I have no idea what I'm doing with wigs. So like, I'm just, I'm just kind of making it up as I go along. For a second attempt, I'm not mad. I think this is so cute. If you could tell, I'm a bit inspired by ketamine, but I just, Look at me go, mom. Brace yourselves because there's a cheeky little surprise in this for both of us, because I have no idea how this is gonna turn out. Because the wig is blacklight. But so is some of the makeup. <laughs> I'm lighting up like Christmas. <laughs> Just fight me right now. Like, fight me right now. Because this is, I look, I'm good under blacklight. I'm good out of blacklight. This is, I'm also just blown away by the wig. How did I not know that this was neon until today when I put it on? Oh my gosh. This is why I use the UV palette. Cause I was like, I want my hair to match my eyes. 
Drag Race Down Under season two. If you need another queen, she's here. <laughs> I want Ketamine to be my mom. <gasps> no, actually, I want Ketamine and Anita Wiglet to be like my drag aunties. Can you adopt me as your drag aunties? Cause I just, like this is my audition. Did I do good enough? You can teach me how to do wigs, auntie and auntie. <laughs> But I just hope that you are feeling as fantastic as I do right now, because this is, you can, you could not wipe the smile off my face right now. This is just, this is everything that I wanted. There's a few little things that I can fix up, but this is everything that I wanted. I just, I, I feel so good. And I just hope you are feeling as good as I am. I hope that you are having a fantastic day, a fantastic week, a fantastic month, a fantastic year. And I hope that you are doing as fantastic as always. Bye everyone. Woo!